Hello again, uh, Patrick Love here. This is lecture five of my climate science discussion. Um, we are continuing our investigation of the question of is it warming? Uh, let me get you set up here again with my screen. Okay, right there and there. Wonderful. So, as I said, we are focused. Um, this is the second part of the uh, answer to the question, is it getting warmer? In the first part, we looked at some paleoclimatology uh, to understand what has happened in the recent past, uh, the recent being the last uh, three million years. You decide whether you think that's recent or not. Although the Earth goes way back in time, uh, we did go back a little further and look at a uh, thermal event in the Paleocene, Eocene time frame. Um, and I should quickly add as an add-on to that um, paleoclimatology piece of our course, that you could go back in time and find lots of places where the Earth has been warmer than it is today, or even warmer than we're going to get. Um, because, uh, but of course, there were different animals on the Earth. The, co the, the uh, continents were in different positions. There was a different kind of circulation in the oceans. Uh, lots of things were different. They're very hard to analyze in those days. But my answer to the question when people say, well, surely the Earth was a lot warmer a long time ago, I think it's fair to say, of course it was. Um, but there, we, we didn't have an advanced civilization of 7.7 .7 billion people living on the earth either. Another way of looking at that is whatever is happening to the earth today in terms of warming, the planet is gonna be just fine. It's us that we need to worry about, not the planet uh, and our civilization, right? So, and the second thing we did is we looked at the, um, we looked at the instrumental temperature measurements. Uh, this is an example right here. This is the famous graph this one is done by the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center people. Um, up, and I have updated the, I, I graphed the data they have, but I've updated the recent dots based on numbers that they have published for the last two or three years. I continue to add dots to this as they publish the, the next number. Uh, and we talked about how this instrument data uh, requires a lot of statistical analysis and a lot of averaging and that averaging over all these things is something that uh, scientists are always a little worried about. Um, you know, there's a very famous uh, saying in science, if you uh, put your head in a bucket of ice and your feet in the oven, on average, you're at the right temperature. But there's a lot of other physical things going on, right? So you're always worried about hiding stuff when you average together lots of information like this. But the thing that has emerged over time is there is a very strong signal um, rising out of this data, which is uh, pretty hard to neglect. And while there have been lots of debates about this data, uh, lots of different groups analyze it in slightly different ways and pretty much come out with the same, the same results. But what we want to do now is we want to say that there are other ways to confirm warming on the Earth. Uh, you could think of these ways as different kinds of thermometers. And instead of walking around with the instruments that are used to measure the ocean temperature or the instruments that are used to measure the air temperature, we have other thermometers to think about. And that's what we're gonna focus on in the second lecture that deals with this question. And the way to think about that is what changes would we predict if we say the earth is getting warmer? Well, the first thing we know is we measure the air surface, the sea surface, the air temperature, and maybe the troposphere temperature up through the, up through the troposphere and um, see what happens. And that's the direct measurements that we've talked about. And we see that those are difficult to make, but in fact, they can be made. Uh, and apart from a lot of statistical stuff going on, they seem to show a signal. But the other things we know we can measure is we can measure the Earth's ice, known as the cryosphere. That, the cryosphere is just a name for all the ice on the Earth. We say that probably should be melting if the Earth is getting warmer. Um, 
the humidity in the air should increase, right? The temperature, as temperature goes up, the air will hold more moisture. And so we should be able to measure that. Um, sea level should rise because as the temperature goes up, water expands. Um, and of course, if some of the ice is melting, some of that will run off into the sea, right? Finally, we should see changes in the ecology of plants and animals. In other words, ecosystems are not gonna stay the same. Um, and what we know about the earth is that plants and animals are very temperature dependent. Uh, that is, they're sensitive to temperature changes. So in some sense, their behavior and their success depends on temperature in a kind of way that makes them into a kind of thermometer. So here is one of those predictions. This is the overall moisture content. So the, there are two graphs here. They are from 1970 to roughly 20, 2018, I believe. And um, they are uh, the, the, uh, the top one is called the specific hum humidity. That in a way is the absolute hum humidity. In other words, it's the grams of water vapor divided by kilograms of air, right? So um, if you wanna think about this, this is a direct measurement of how many grams of water vapor there, there is in the air in a equal amount. The one at the bottom of the page is the relative humidity over the land. Um, you'll notice that the relative humidity, the relative humidity is measured relative to the saturation vapor pressure. In other words, um, the relative humidity is how much water is in the air divided by how much water could be in the air at this temperature, right? So what you see is the relative, even though the absolute humidity on this graph called the specific, it's called specific because it's per unit mass, even though uh, the specific humidity has increased uh, and continues to increase over the time frame. The relative humidity has stayed about the same um, and has decreased a little bit from 2000 uh, down. So what does this mean? This means that there's more moisture in the air as predicted and has continued to increase. Whether you're over land or you're over the ocean, there's more moisture there. However, the moisture that's in the air has not kept up with the ability of the air to hold even more, right? So basically the temperature has gone up enough that the saturation vapor pressure has gone up faster than the amount of moisture available to put in the air. So if there was more moisture available, it would go into the air and the relative humidity probably would have stayed around the same because that's, or I don't know, it's a little hard to say that, but the processes that keep the relative humidity in the air have to do with condensation and precipitation and the availability of moisture on the ground, the absolute humidity just has to do with how much water ends up there. So this is a, a measurement that suggests that there is definitely more moisture in the air as predicted from a temperature increase. The other thing that we can say, and you've probably heard a lot about this, is uh, ice around the world in its various forms has um, declined. So here is a graph of the September minimum in the Arctic sea ice extent, right? Now extent simply means area. So if you take a satellite picture, you can measure the area of the Arctic sea ice. You can measure it every week of the year. In September, it's at its minimum, um, no matter, you know, each in the, obviously in the winter, it's at its maximum. It covers the most area. This is just a measurement of what happens at the minimum. And you can see that it has gone down over time from a high of maybe 7 million square kilometers or seven and a half down to today's number, you know, which it's pretty noisy, but somewhere's around four and a half million square kilometers and um, continuing to fall, right? Um, 
if we come to a slightly different, because it's a different way of drawing the same thing. So on this graph, uh, on the y-axis are in uh, square kilometers, the x-axis is just from um, January 2018 to 19. Um, and what you're seeing on this graph is the band is the historical range, which goes way back in time. Uh, well, maybe not way back, but into the 70s when we had satellites to make pictures of these things. Uh, so the blue band is the Antarctic band and the dark line, the dark blue line is the 2018 actual values for the, you know, the period of time that we've got measured there. Looks like we measured up until July or August of 18. And the similar for the Arctic. The Arctic shows the um, 2018 historical band in pink. And then the dark uh, line is the 2018 number. So you can see they're at the low end of the band, um, indicating that the, um, and, and, and we probably indicating that they're, they're melting, uh, showing less extent. Um, you probably have heard that the Arctic is warming the fastest on the planet. We talked about that in an earlier lecture. And so the Arctic shows in 2018, uh, actually it's almost completely outside the band of previous experiences for the Arctic, whereas the Antarctic is changing more slowly, um, probably because it's surrounded by the Southern Ocean, which tends to keep it, it's a completely isolated continent. Um, the Arctic, of course, has no land below it, it's just ice. Um, and that may have a part to play as well in how fast it's uh, warming up. Okay. This is the glacier. So this is um, what's called glacier mass balance. So the mass balance is the difference between the accumulation of uh, snow and the ablation of snow. So the, the melting or uh, Sublimation, you know, sublimation is when the ice melts from a solid directly into a, a gas or melting uh, causes ablation. Um, so basically, if the, if the glacier stayed the same each year, it would go through a cycle of obviously of accumulating snow in the winter and melting a little bit in the summer um, or um, subliming a little bit in the summer. Uh, and this curve would be straight across, right? Uh, each year would balance. Uh, however, the, for something like 40 reference glaciers, which is the, uh, the red uh, line, uh, the best, these are some of the largest, the reference gl glaciers are some of the largest glaciers in uh, Europe and North America. Uh, you see, uh, mass balance loss. And then all glaciers refers not to all the glaciers on the earth, but to something like um, 130 glaciers around the world. So it's a larger data set. That's what all glaciers means. And they pretty much track the reference glaciers. The reference glaciers have been studied for a lot longer. That's why they're called reference. Um, Basically, if you look at NASA satellite data, there are something like 170,000 glaciers on the Earth. Um, and if everything melted in all those glaciers, it's estimated that sea, sea level would rise like 17 inches. Um, obviously, if Antarctica uh, melts, you'll get a lot more sea rise, or Greenland melts, you'll get a lot more sea rise than that. But uh, the glaciers are making a big difference uh, today in sea level rise, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So glaciers are melting, which is part of the cryosphere. The Arctic ice is melting, which is part of the cryosphere. Um, if you look at uh, energy stored in the oceans, um, heat energy stored in the oceans, um, we can look at the top 3,000 feet, about 1,000 meters. Uh, and the energy stored there is related to the density of the water in the layer the heat capacity of the water, and the temperature of the layer. The density is related 
to the amount of salt in the water, which changes the density as well as its temperature. So basically, um, we can add up, we can find out the total heat energy stored each year. Um, these data show uh, curves for each year of the heat content. One of the things you should know is if you look at the scale on the left, it's in joules, which we talked about in the first couple lectures, is a measurement of energy. Uh, it's, um, the units are 10 to the 22nd joules. That's one with 22 zeros after it. Um, and basically a unit on this graph, um, one times 10 to the 22 joules is 18 times the total energy used by all the people on the earth in a year. So this is a lot of energy. Each unit on this graph is a lot of energy. Uh, and you can see a rather dramatic increase from 1970 on in the heat content that's stored in the oceans. In fact, the oceans are absorbing about 90% of the increased energy that we believe is coming um, in terms of warming. So if the oceans weren't capturing this much energy, if it, was, if it was going into the atmosphere, it would be very warm on the Earth. It would be a lot warmer, um, which just goes to show how much energy um, there is that, that the Earth is in, is, is the imbalance at the top of the atmosphere, which we talked about in the first lecture. Um, so the heat content of the oceans are going up, and that is a thermometer that's telling us that the Earth is, the Earth's surface is getting a lot warmer. How do we know this measurement? This sounds like an interesting measurement, and it is. Um, we have um, what are now called Argo floats. Um, these have been around since the 70s, uh, actually since the 60s, I think, 60s and 70s. They get added to and subtracted from each year. You'll notice these are the positions of these floats. They actually float around. They're maintained by different countries. This is an international effort. Uh, you can see the Australia has 380 of them. I believe the United States has 2,138. So we have a lot of them. Um, and we maintain these. These floats sit on the surface. They deploy a boom that goes down uh, 3,000 uh, meters into the water and measures salinity, temperature, and density so that you can uh, infer the energy in the water. They also float around capturing velocities um, so that you know uh, the, the ocean currents. A lot, you learn more about the ocean currents. So that's um, a useful thing. They're very good measurements, so that's a good sense of what's going on there. Now, the other um, thing we said earlier is that the oceans are themselves a thermometer because um, as liquid warms up, it expands. And so we would expect the sea level to rise. Now, we might expect it to rise for a couple reasons. We know parts of the cryosphere are melting. So we would expect sea level to rise for that reason as well. But we also know that temperature will expand the water. So this, these are data that go back, way back in time to the 1880s, actually. Um, and the orange uh, triangles are tidal gauge measurements. So these are basically uh, measurements, if you want to think about it, of a gauge uh, at the seashore, which was just measuring the height of the water as the tide went in and out. So each day it would be up and down. Um, based on the tidal frequency. Um, and you could infer the height of the ocean, right? Now, in fact, um, over time, especially this kind of time frame, uh, the Earth, there's two complications. The ocean may be expanding, but at the same time, the Earth is either going up or down on that coastline. It is it's subsiding or rebounding. If um, because we are only 10,000 years from a fairly frozen cryosphere where there was a lot more ice on land, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Some of the Northern Hemisphere uh, continents are um, 
are still rebounding at, because the ice melted off them. So all that weight of the ice sitting on the continent pushed it down. Now that it's melting, the continent might be going up. What's happening at the seashore is complicated. So for example, the Eastern United States, this, this shore is actually subsiding uh, because the center of the country is rebounding. And so it's kind of like a hinge. And so the, the tidal measurement has both the subsidence of the seashore, the changes in the continent, as well as the increase in the height of the ocean. So it can be confusing to unravel. These tidal data have been unraveled as much as possible. So they're more or less, we believe, the global sea level. However, the data um, in the yellow uh, squares out towards the end, around 1990 and on, come from satellites. We, uh, these satellites are uh, measuring, basically with an altimeter, measuring the height of the oceans. Now, the oceans vary in their height. So this is a measure of something called the global mean sea level. In other words, it's an average uh, sea level height. And it's been matched up to the tidal data uh, and more or less uh, shows the tidal data as we know it. The interesting thing about this uh, sea level change, we'll get into this some more later on, the interesting thing with sea level change is if you looked over this whole time range, you would see it increasing at a certain rate. It's been accelerating. So you can kind of see a little bit of bow in this curve. In other words, more recently, um, it, the average over the last, let's say, 30 or 40 years might be three millimeters every uh, year, um, but it's accelerating at about 0.08 millimeters per year. Um, and we'll get into some of the implications of that. But what you can see on this graph, the simple measurement, uh, the simple message is that sea level is rising. That's what we expect if the earth is warming. We expect that because we expect the ice to be melting and we expect the oceans to be expanding. Um, and those things seem to be confirmed by this graph. Now, there are many measures of animals and plants reacting to warming. Uh, this is one study uh, done by the Audubon Society. It's referenced at the bottom. Um, it shows for um, a number of bird species, I think about 20 on this graph, but uh, for a number of bird species, it shows how their winter destinations have changed uh, from the winter of 66, 67 to the winter of 2005, 2006. Uh, basically, the top corner is the average January temperature in the United States, how that has changed. And basically, if you take one of these, like let's say you take the uh, rightmost one on the graph, the ring billed gull, it basically says they used to fly south into southern Louisiana. And now they're wintering over in what looks like uh, Tennessee, right? Somewhere is around Western Tennessee. I don't know if that's near Nashville or wherever. Those poor people, those good people in Southern Tennessee get to see the ring-billed gull more than the people who used to see them down in, perhaps down in uh, Louisiana. So basically, uh, birds are wintering further north. Uh, and have changed or and sometimes further west. Um, and they are reacting basically to temperature. Now there are many such, um, many such uh, measurements that have been made and I won't go into them all, but fish are uh, moving north and to deeper water. Uh, north American trees, a very interesting study I saw about North American trees. Uh, for 86 species, angiosperms, which is a particular family of trees, uh, have moved their location westward by 15.4 kilometers per decade. Gymnosperms uh, have moved poleward by 11 kilometers per decade. Uh, you may have heard about pine bark beetles. Uh, we will talk later about the damage they're causing, but they are moving up in altitude 
and further, their range is moving further north. So we see in plants and animals a reaction to the warming that the, um, of the earth as a measurement of temperature. So in summary, there have been, in summary of both uh, this lecture, this short lecture about uh, other ways to measure temperature and the previous one about paleo temperature and direct measurements of temperature, we can say that there have been significant variation in temperature over the Earth's history. In the last three million years, uh, there's been an ice age, glacial and interglacial periods, variations in temperature by as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Today, the Earth's surface is warming from a baseline that, say, you take the average temperature from 1950 to 1980, it is warm from there by about 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit, something like 0.7 or 8 degrees centigrade. And we can measure that temperature change directly on the land, in the troposphere, and in the top mixed layer of the ocean. The rate of change of the current warming over the last couple hundred years is very fast compared to changes seen in the last three million years. So in those cycling periods, the glacial and interglacials, we saw two degrees Fahrenheit change maybe over the course of a thousand years. It's noisy, but kind of over the course of a thousand years, two degrees Fahrenheit change. We're seeing two degrees Fahrenheit change in a hundred years. And so we're warming quite fast. So in the basic question, we can answer, yes, it's warming. It's a significant warming. And the trend um, doesn't show um, any, um, any stopping in the near, you know, it's still going on. And as long as the direct temperature measurements keep going up, it's becoming harder and harder to suggest that there's something wrong with that method. The method may be complicated, uh, but there is a signal there of, of some sort. Okay, so um, thank you for being at lecture five. We are in the next lectures going to get into the question of why it's warming, which I know a lot of people are very interested in. And we will get on to that in lecture six. Thank you for being here.